We have the next uh, panel discussion. The theme is um, contributions and needs of Arctic science. And we have um, great guests again coming on the stage. Not yet, you are going to stay there. But we have also a great host uh, and, and share for this uh, conversation. She is Kosia Smishek. You can say it right when you come on here. But anyway, uh, she's a researcher from the Arctic Center at the University of Lapland. And uh, the guests who are we are going to get on, on the stage a little bit later, there is Lars uh, Gullerud, who is the president of the University of Art Arctic. Then we have uh, Evan Bloom, who is the director of the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs at the US Department of State in the Washington, Washington DC. And then we have Eva Furman, who, who is the director of the Environment Policy Center, Finnish Environment Institute. And then we have David Scott, who is the president and CEO of Polar Knowledge Canada. And then we have Lars Otteresen, who is a former executive secretary, secretary of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Okay, but anyway, Kosia, the yes. stage is yours. Welcome. All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I said, I hope the coffee break was, was good. Um, because we're about to move to another, I hope, um, exciting and informative panel. So namely, the contributions and needs of Arctic science when it comes to realization of sustainable development goals in the Arctic. And we'll discuss different aspects related to, to those. But I think it goes without saying that science has a um, truly critical role in providing timely information to decision makers, how we can advance, how we can progress to make those goals happen and how we can achieve them in the Arctic. But before we'll go there, it is my pleasure um, to give the floor to, to a person who knows sustainable development goals, I dare to say by heart, uh, because next to being director of the Environment Policy Center at SICA at Finnish Environment Institute in Helsinki, um, Eva Forman is also chair of Finland's Sustainable Development Expert Panel. And perhaps, well, in, the, in that sense, um, Maybe more importantly, seeing connections between Arctic um, and the rest of the planet, she is a member of the working group responsible for drafting first in the series of United Nations sustainable, Global Sustainable Development Reports, the first one due in 2019. So Eva will give now the keynote speech in the session to introduce us all to what the sustainable development goals are about. Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think everyone here in the hall thinks that the Arctic is a really important area, region in the world, and also that there are great challenges in the Arctic, and so do I. But sometimes it helps when we, when we are looking for solutions that we don't really stay in our own area, but approach the issue a little bit from outside it. It helps us to see things clearer when we look at it from outside. And so I will take you on a journey there. Uh, human societies and humans have been doing research and innovation, we could, could call it like that, for hundreds, for thousands of years, and made our well-being as what it is today. And even though we are talking about here a lot of problems, uh, there's a lot of good things, and I think we all agree on that as well. But when these innovations have been done, one by one, a lot of side effects, had, ha, side effects have also arisen, and many of them are negative. And what that has led to is actually something that I see as a Thai football that we have here on the picture. And what is in common with the globe today and with the Thai football is that actually these bindings, these uh, connections that we have in this ball, they are really difficult to break, however we kick it. And so 
The only way actually to solve it is not the same way it has been built, but actually by taking a systemic approach to it. And that's why I quite like the Agenda 2030 and also the SDGs when we look at them as a holistic way, in a systemic way. And the message I would like to give you here today is that actually with this framework of the Agenda 2030, with thinking about the experience, experiences uh, from also other parts of the world, we could use the research in the Arctic and for the Arctic to to find new solutions to the locked up Arctic issues, uh, with, which have a lot of conflicting is, uh, interests. We all know what they are actually, at least uh, the most important ones. We also know that the world is not sustainable. That's why we are here and uh, I also am really happy like Alexi, that this was selected as, as the topic of, of these days. Usually we talk about the planetary boundaries, and we know, for example, that biodiversity uh, loss has really gone beyond the limits uh, that it should be in. But we can look at the sustainability issue from other perspectives as well, and many of them have actually come up here during these days. For example, the world population growth, it's still growing, even though actually the annual growth rate has, has stopped already a long time ago. But the world population is, is, keeps growing. And also, for example, hunger is an issue that have been tackled and the pie that we see here has become smaller. But we still have a lot of people who live uh, in hunger, also in the Arctic areas. I have an Arctic background as well, and I am quite aware of that, and in all the Arctic countries. And in this picture, we can see that certain areas around the world has actually got their pie becoming bigger. And we can also look at the issue of sustainability of the globe from the issue of uh, um, equality and equity. For example, gender issues, we can see that of women in Middle Africa, only 26.8% can uh, make informed decisions regarding their sexual relations, about contraceptive use and health care. So, the, the whole story in the Agenda 2030, as it has been written, is that if there is not justice for everyone, there is justice for no one. So, this is more how the uh, Agenda 2030 has been built upon. We know that it's a combination of the Millennium Goals and then the, uh, the uh, Press, uh, previous um, uh, uh, agenda for sustainable development. But it's also about peaceful, inclusive societies, and it strongly emphasizes the implementation. And it also links, it raises the issue of interactions and the cross cutting elements that there exist. So I was really happy when I heard the previous panel and, and the previous panels when they, they were asked with sustainable development goal they like. They actually like those goals that were somehow uniting all the others. There's something else that's really interesting about the Agenda 2030 and one of them that really includes uh, or takes uh, is important in the Arctic is that we are not to only talking about planet Earth and eco ecosystems, but also about Mother Earth. And we are also talking about the fact that no one is left behind. But we are also talking about universality, and universality means that every country, rich or poor, developed or less developed or developing, actually has to act on the, uh, the goals. And this means that from sustainable development perspective, all countries in the world are developing countries. This is a huge task. And that's why public uh, sector is not enough. And we heard about the business. We need the society in large, we need business, but we need 
all the other actors in the societies as well to take part in this big task that we have. And that actually motivates everyone because it unites us. It doesn't say that those are bad and these are good, those act and those don't act. We are all in the same boat because we all want that the boat won't sink. So especially all countries are uh, made to commit to act, but also regions. Here we have the 17, I'm not going to go into those except that I see them as one. It's a nice palette of colors, but for me it's only one big palette. But the challenge is really there. How to do it in practice? And that's, I suppose, the issue that we have here as well. Everyone can raise nice things, but how it happens in practice? And is there are many countries who are very much behind with indicators, with uh, following the whole thing and, and knowing how to go forward, all of them actually. So also uh, the UN uh, woke up in the fact that the countries and the regions need help and they need evidence what works and what doesn't or what could work and what couldn't. So. The panel that Gosia was mentioning is here. That's the first panel, but there will be several panels afterwards. So the decision that has been made is that there will be panels to bring evidence, scientific panels to bring evidence from science from on the global sustainable development and also the ways forward. And we have been working on these issues and here is our framework. We are focusing on four different issues. The first issue is interactions between the SDGs, which means we want to raise issues that when the evident trade-offs appear, that those who are the losers will be also supported and carried to the next phase and to come up with some ideas. And in particular, to uh, make it uh, evident that there's lots of cost uh, co-benefits and we should make them visible. They might be in different time perspectives, but there are a lot of co-benefits that has not been real, uh, seen as yet. The second issue, which is actually almost uh, the core of the whole report and everything else feeds into it, is the pathways to transformation. And there isn't only one path. Several countries or different countries, different regions can build different kind of pathways. But what uh, evidence can bring is to show where are the opportunities and what are the obstacles that should be uh, somehow tackled. Give examples and give theories. We are going to tackle the role of science. That's really crucial. And that was questioned already from the previous panel, already to help us to get started. But this uh, group, we are very much focusing on the science policy interface because we see that this is where the, the, the greatest challenges at the moment lie. And then thinking out of the box, there are issues that are not actually included in the uh, goals and that's because it's a political document and sometimes we have to accept that there are political documents when you have all the nations in the world included but it's good to discuss in a in a constructive way also those issues that have been neglected or that are emerging issues so we are going to tackle those as well and now we have passed for one year and we have worked a lot with different networks and you are one of the networks I'm, I'm that's why I'm really happy I was invited here to talk because it gives me opportunity to motivate you and also to actually make lots of notes from what's been discussed here and next year will be a lot of writing the following year will be a, a, a review of what we have been done, sort of critical review on it and starting to make the technical uh, reports and then also to communicate the results. And something I really want to uh, raise for you is that at the moment there is a call for uh, contributions to to all networks to come up with good uh, suggestions for our group. This uh, can be found, I have some brochures of this downstairs, but this can be found from the website of, of the group as well. 
And now I'll take some examples I would like to, to raise to you, some food for thought, how to work. And one thing is, is, how do you find those key challenges your region or your country or your community should uh, focus on? There's lots of indices, and indices are really good, but it's really good to look at different indices and even uh, link it with uh, some um, uh, empowerment process in your own region to ask the civil society, how do you rank the different um, uh, SDGs from, from the perspective of your region or from your country and combine this all. We did this in Finland about uh, one and a half years ago. My second example also comes from Finland. It's by the expert panel of sustainable development in Finland. Uh, we made a paper on five spearheads that for sustainable development because we thought that it's really important actually not to look at the individual SDGs but to look actually those things that are happening linked with them or then in between them and we came to these five and the core thing here is that we need to decouple not only the economy and e e uh, environment but also economy and well-being and well-being and environment and from that we came with these five different ideas where we say that equality and inclusion are building blocks for sustainable society that energy and natural resource reform should be also socially fair, that environment is the basis for health and well-being, and that rethinking approaches to work and e e economy should be built together, and then that from individual and global level, all these levels should be covered. But in, in uh, interlinkages, that's the hard bit. But that's where everyone starts. And when we think about policymakers, they are in silos and they should be in silos. It makes the pluralism to the societies. It's important, but you need to work with others. And if there is no guidance from science, then the policymakers will take the easy ones, the matchmaking with the obvious allies. And there could be outdated and wrong understanding also about the interlinkages. So someone uh, in Sweden uh, worked together in Future Earth, his name is Mons Nilsson, actually a very famous person, wrote a paper in Nature where there's a very practical guide how you actually find out which are the interlinkages that are most important for your area. Well, I mentioned already the hindering and enabling factors that are so important to bring up when we are looking at the pathways to transformation. And how to deal with the big bunch of science that there is. Well, science nowadays works very much when we are working together with policy is to do meta-analysis. Meta-analysis of this huge number of articles that they are or cases. And here is an example, for example, the question is how ca can you take forward uh, protected areas and poverty at the same time. An analysis of 171 papers, and it came up with the conclusion that in most cases it is synergistic uh, uh, to take them both at the same time. It's positive to both of them. There are, of course, cases where you need, need strict protection, but basically it's like that. Well. I mentioned the cross-sectoral collaboration, that's the cru crucial issue for the um, uh, interlinkages. So how actually to uh, use the evidence or, or build the evidence on that? And here is an example. I mentioned that health, uh, well-being and nature are nowadays connected. There's lots of very new research that shows that both mental and physical health uh, uh, feeds into that. And this is also um, financially really important to governments, to uh, communities. And one really crucial issue is, is our inflammatory uh, diseases that are growing, especially with the modern lifestyle and with urbanization. And uh, so uh, one way to tackle that issue is that we have a lot of different uh, uh, groups that are communicating uh, 
together the planning, recreation sector, sports, uh, building, environment, health, education, and so forth. Bring these together and plan the societies in such a way that it supports the health to nature connection for us. Well, the other one is the connection between actors, which is a bit, bit different because that is the business private sector, public sector, and so forth, link, linkages. So there's a lot of cases also where this has been tried, how to build that. And one connection is between in, uh, employment and business. And uh, for example, a, a project called Openness was doing a lot of cases on, on these issues around the world. And so the very crucial thing is that economy actually is a means instead of a goal. And, and even though it sounds so obvious, it, it has not been like that, understood like that in, in our uh, societies for long. And the other thing is that the meaningfulness and quality of work should be taken into account when we build our economic models. And to be able to build those, we need public investments and innovative culture allow that to happen. Well, we have talked here a lot also about time perspectives, taking the uh, path dependencies and forecasting to the future and living in the present. This is where science has a lot to contribute. And this is something that is really on our hands when we are talking about sustainable development. Here is an example about immigration and refugees. It's not a new thing. It's something that we have known before. So we have understanding of that and understanding how we can deal with those issues. In a short term, it's also a question of past and present because these people come from somewhere and we again are taking something in here. So how do we deal with it? And one way again, using the uh, natural capital for this is, is one way to go forward. It helps at the social integration, it helps with a place attachment, and it helps also with the quality of life and health and well-being, as I already mentioned. Well, something that is very typical and, and so often raised when we are talking about the Arctic issues actually is that when we are talking about the sustainable development the, uh, goals and the targets, we are talking about how are they reach on national level or, or supranationally and regional level. But you, typically these things are interconnected much further out. There's lots of flows between different areas of the world. And this makes a different kind of uh, swing into this issue. I don't say it's a bad or a good thing, but it's definitely something that should be discussed that it is sustainable. So there's burden shifting, there's externalities and there are spillovers, which means that, for example, countries in Europe, in the EU, that are scoring the best in the world on sustainable development are ranked as the highest ones with the spillovers, which means that they gain these wonderful scores by actually pouring the impact somewhere else. This picture is very familiar to you. Not this particular picture, but this pattern, I'm sure with that. So when we have these flows of resources or flows with people or money from one place to the other, the local consumption uh, is, is uh, the driving force, but it affects the local uh, environment in the place where all this goes, but it also affects where it comes from, that area. So this, again, is really important to be analyzed uh, from the research point of view. I will close with something that doesn't really come from textbooks. It's, it's about the connection between our minds. This has been a little bit touched upon in some, somebody's uh, talks. And I claim that actually we have a deficiency of ethics of policy making, of research, and of being human beings. And this comes from the idea that actually we don't use the full capacity, the full knowledge that we have from our life, 
full life, neither from our everyday life, private life, working life, when we do decisions. We don't use it when in the intuition and so forth, but we are in boxes. And this is a great challenge. And this is not an issue only from the heart. This is something that can be studied. It's brain research, it's psychological research, it's organizational research, social research, and so forth. And I would like to close with that, my uh, introductory uh, remarks. Thank you. Well, okay. yes. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I will invite yeah, other members of the panel. Floor. Um, well, um, if it felt to you in some way how, a little bit similar to how it felt to me, it seems that the challenge ahead of us is really paramount. So let's see how our panelists will address some of those issues. Um, so before we'll go to discussions, I will still ask our our speakers yeah. for uh, for their short introductions, um, and I would ask you to short to shortly introduce yourself and perhaps if in your introductory remarks you could actually address the question. Um, so how in your respective fields in your work what does actually what is the role of science in realization of SDGs what is the most pressing issues that we face as scientific community or those that deal with scientific issues Lars could you start with you so um, is this on yes, yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Lars Kullerud I'm leading something called the University Arctic it is a group of uh, 188 universities and uh, higher education institutions around the whole Arctic. It's created by the Arctic Council 20 years back and uh, that unites basically everyone who is in the academic university science community of the Arctic and beyond. We have together 50 different kind of research groups, we call them thematic networks and institutes and of course that's a big machine who can address many topics of the Arctic and we do address many of the sustainable development uh, goals through those. I would like to say a few words about Arctic research. Uh, one of the things we have done recently is uh, carrying out a comprehensive study of all Arctic research in the world, as we know it, published in uh, peer-reviewed science journals. And if you study that, there is some approximately 10,000 research papers out every year, which has some component of Arctic research. So it's a lot being made. Very few of those actually make it to policy making. But if you study what is this science happening, uh, and think of it in the terms of development goals, uh, it is in remarkable that within natural science and environmental science, uh, there is some 5% of all natural science and environmental science in the world, or earth sciences, which is my business, uh, that has an Arctic component. On the other side, there is only 0.1 or 0.2% of all medicine, health, engineering, technology, innovation sciences in the world, or economic science in the world, which ever mention any relevance to the Arctic. Humanities and social science in between, 0.4%. So among natural scientists, we have been very good at addressing Arctic questions, even if we think we have still questions left to answer. But what is it wrong with humanities when the things linked to people and daily life like technology, economics, etc., don't get addressed by those communities. So we do have some fundamental challenges in Arctic sciences uh, because some sciences simply don't work on Arctic matters, and I think they should. So I think that is maybe a fundamental piece of fact about Arctic sciences. I believe that the sustainable development goals provide a fantastic framework to have a discussion of what matters and what don't matters in the Arctic. Because they lift our eyes between the short-term agenda 
short term meaning what's on the radar, not necessarily a short term thing like climate change. Everybody think about climate change in the Arctic, but very few think about livelihood, business, the economics, or gender equality, or and the other goals. So I think we should be extremely happy that we now have those goals and Finland put this on the table so that we can take that route. I would like to mention one of these networks here in Rovaniemi, because we have one on uh, uh, which is about innovation and design of the Arctic. So maybe we can do research which build knowledge about what is northern Arctic design. Maybe that can help us for the future. That's a good example of somebody trying to think differently about the Arctic in a positive way. We do have the strength of UArctic, we do have the strength of the IASC and IASA, we do have the strength of the Arctic Council, so we have a fantastic framework collaboration in the Arctic. We do have the strong role and engagement of these peoples. We have a, still a lot of challenges. Education, which is something we're concerned about, has big gaps in, in education which are relevant. Because the big challenge is, if you live in a northern community, what is really relevant to you? Is that the same, which is the relevant in the capital, or is it something else? Where is the power that decides what's relevant? It's probably primarily outside the Arctic. So we need a change in that. And I would finalize with one suggestion. There is one even cheap tool to solve many of the challenges. Establish a good, nice mobility program for the Arctic so that the teacher in Nunavut Arctic College can go to the Sami University College and get inspired from each other, etc., from field to field, that kind of cooperation. Then we can build much stronger and more resilient and more relevant education for the North for the future. Thank you very much. So, sounds great. It seems before the end of first remark, we already have suggestions for action. That's, that's really great. Uh, and next speaker, I'll give the floor to you, Evan. Thank you very much, uh, Gosha. Am I now on? With I believe. Yeah, yes. Okay, right. very good. Thank you very much. Uh, so, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Evan Bloom. I'm director of the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs at the U.S. State Department in, in Washington. Um, and so I'm a diplomat and a lawyer, not a scientist or an academic, so um, I'm going to leave uh, kind of the pro profound questions of, of science to, to others who knew that better on this stage. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Gosha, for organizing the panel and also uh, the government of uh, Finland. Uh, Finland is, of course, uh, the chair of the Arctic Council at this point. They're doing a fantastic job with their uh, chairmanship, and the U.S. is uh, enjoying a great cooperation with, with Finland. And so this is really the kind of uh, conference uh, that one would think of, uh, of a chair of, of, of the Arctic Council uh, uh, hosting because it brings all the synergies together of, uh, uh, of the, the work with the Council. So um, I'm very glad that you're doing this. Um, um, I think I've been invited to be on this panel because um, I was uh, recently finished being co-chair of the Arctic Council Science Cooperation Task Force. I was uh, co-chair with Vladimir Barbin, who was on the last uh, panel, um, and we spent three years uh, putting together a legally binding agreement on scientific uh, cooperation. Uh, which I'll uh, uh, get to, to that in, in a moment. Um, but we certainly do uh, science uh, diplomacy in my area of the, of the State Department. Um, and you asked, uh, Gosha, what uh, the Agenda 2030 and the, and the Sustainable Development Goals mean for, for my work. Um, so, uh, as I said, my area is diplomacy, and of course these are very important documents. Um, and they present the, the, really the backdrop for discussions related to international cooperation on sustainable development. And I, I've spent a fair amount of time on, in the past on the Rio process. I was a U.S. negotiator at the World Summit on Sustainable Development, which resulted in the Johannesburg Plan of Action. Um, and certainly Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals are a part of the continuation of, of that process. So uh, my government recognizes Agenda 2030 as a global framework uh, for sustainable development that can help countries work toward peace and prosperity. 
It's a common rallying point for uh, the international community and the private sector to share both the burdens and opportunities of addressing the challenge, challenges of sustainable development. And so as many of the panels uh, going on here at Arctic Spirit can attest, this uh, agenda is uh, certainly relevant to the Arctic. We see this as part of many international conversations, in th including those going on at the Arctic Council, notably within uh, the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group. The projects there are certainly consistent with Agenda 2030. 30 and the Sustainable Development Goals. So um, you've also asked what the role of science is in realizing the Sustainable Development Goals in the Arctic. Um, and I, I think, and it flows very much from the, our opening presentation, science is vitally important to sustainable development. Uh, science informs both economic development and environmental protection and science-based decision-making is at the core of policies that promote sustainable development. Um, sustainable development needs metrics that science is able to provide, and policies and results need to be measurable and quantifiable. So I've had the opportunity to think about these sort of themes in the past working on this uh, new um, uh, science agreement that was uh, recently negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council and was signed by the eight Arctic states, all of the foreign ministers of the Arctic states in uh, May of this year. And I, if we could put up uh, a map with me. Um, I'm sure, sorry if that replaces the really cute reindeer we had at the beginning of the discussions before, but we can go back to the reindeer later on. But um, this is a representation. It's a little bit easier than looking at a, at a legal agreement. This is uh, something we were able to put together recently at the department that um, demonstrates the area of coverage of the new agreement. Um, and uh, we felt, the, the Arctic states felt that it was um, really important to act um, to remove obstacles to science, to help promote the work of scientists. Um, the, and the work isn't just about science for science sake, but helps with decision making by Arctic communities to help them make decisions that affect their livelihoods. So uh, science has a strong connection to sustainable development as, and, suspe and especially successful sustainable development. And the reason I wanted to put this up on the screen is that um, the states themselves uh, undertook a process um, of trying to decide where scientific activities that would occur in the Arctic would be subject to the agreement. But it's also important to understand that the, um, the cooperation, the facilitation that occurs within the agreement is not just what is within that red outline, but it occurs outside as well. So if you, the objective of your work is within that red area, um, if you're going to have an Arctic conference in Ottawa or in Miami, or the facilitation works there to help you get visas for participants going to that conference. It helps for uh, getting uh, scientific uh, materials uh, to go across borders, which aren't necessarily represented those by those red lines. Anyway, I should move on. But um, the I guess the point I want to make is that this agreement is designed to promote uh, uh, science, which is at the core of, of having successful sustainable development. More well, later. But Thank you very much. Um, I think for, for me personally, when I was thinking about this scientific cooperation agreement, of course, very um, at distance, but to me, it was kind of uh, illustration also of goal 17 of partnerships that we need. Of course, well, under this goal, we think about partnerships with different groups of society. But I think, well, Arctic countries truly set here example of how we can also work um, circum in circumpolar Arctic. Um, but I guess next to this, there is also a matter of, well, a research facility and what we actually do have in the Arctic. And I think this map is perfect for us to have a look at, at this region at the moment and what, what do we actually know about this? What, what are the gaps and how we are trying to fill them? David? 
Well, thank you, Gosia, and it's a pleasure to be back in northern Finland once again uh, and to be uh, among uh, an esteemed group of individuals here on this panel continuing a discussion uh, about how we can mobilize towards the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And if I can get a couple of new pictures on the screen, thank you. Um, the organization that I have the privilege to lead as President and Chief Executive Officer is Polar Knowledge Canada. And the emphasis is really on knowledge. We're a knowledge organization creating new knowledge and applying knowledge, whether it's new knowledge or existing knowledge, to serve Northerners, many of whom are Indigenous, all Canadians and indeed the globe. Because as I think has been made abundantly clear here, uh, the Arctic region is interconnected. It doesn't recognize political boundaries. Uh, and it's connected to the rest of the world. Arctic phenomena influence things that happen everywhere on the planet. Uh, so it really is an interconnected system. There's a number of key points, and this is essentially my concluding slide, but not my last slide. Um, it's in terms of mobilizing sustainable development goals, it really needs to be a bottom-up, community-driven thing. It's the people in the communities who need to be the beneficiaries of new knowledge that advances uh, through science and research the attainment of those sustainable development goals. Uh, so we're looking for, first and foremost, bringing many ways of knowing to the table to create new knowledge, whether it's Western scientific knowledge that's learned in a university setting, or it's traditional knowledge that's been learned through centuries, and in fact millennia, of experience on the land and ocean. Different ways of knowing, but equally valid in solving the questions that Northerners themselves have. And in the case of Canada, most of our Northern citizens are Indigenous either Inuit or First Nations or Métis, a vast uh, diversity of indigenous groups across Canada's vast Arctic. So engaging with northern communities, understanding the challenges that they face, and we've heard this several times already, um, is really the basis by which we can come up with the solutions to advance uh, well-being in, in northern communities, and in so doing we'll advance on the sustainable development goals. I'll focus on three of them uh, in, in my presentation just to underscore where some of the science that Polar Knowledge Canada is leading uh, can assist. Our mandate as a new Canadian federal government organization uh, is to advance knowledge of the Canadian Arctic, improve economic opportunities and environmental stewardship and quality of life for Northerners and all Canadians. Develop and disseminate knowledge uh, of other circumpolar regions, including the Antarctic. The polar regions are connected to one another, even though they're at opposite ends of the planet. Strengthening Canada's leadership on Arctic issues and, and I'll show you pictures, establishing a hub for scientific research in the Canadian Arctic. I'm referring to the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, or CHARS as it's known, uh, in the community of Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, in uh, western, uh, western part of that territory, the central part of our Arctic. Uh, this is the campus here, the main research building, some accommodation units. Um, we have the capability of hosting indigenous scientists, community members, and scientists from across Canada and around the world to work together to create the new knowledge that can advance the lives uh, of Northerners and all Canadians. We focus in our current science and technology plan on four key areas. The first is the cryosphere, the frozen part of, the, uh, of, of our environment, the, cry the cryosphere, permafrost, sea ice, snow, uh, renewable and alternative forms of energy to move away from imported fossil fuels, uh, understanding how the land and the sea are changing and what that means to people, uh, and infrastructure, in particular housing, because a safe, appropriate, environmentally friendly, culturally relevant home is the foundation for sustainability and a good life. There we go. Uh, on the subject of uh, affordable and clean energy, we need to move away from imp imported fossil fuels and harvest local energy sources, whether it's a, a flowing river, uh, a consistent wind, or the availability of solar energy many months of the year. Looking into infrastructure, again, I'll emphasize that housing is a critical shortage in Canada's north, in our Arctic. Uh, northern peoples need culturally relevant, technologically relevant housing that can allow them to live a better life. It's the foundation for a better life. 
the environment itself supports northern communities. Uh, there are still those who, who live from the, the bounty of the land in a sustainable way, and that land and sea are changing. And as, the, as it changes, it impacts the sustainability of, of the peoples who depend on that. So there's knowledge to be created and mobilized to better sustain life in our Arctic. I'll leave it at that at this point, and we can continue on in the discussion. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that for me personally, um, always images of solar panels in the Arctic, this is something that I, that I really find interesting and inspiring in, in many ways. If we look for the illustration of how science, technology and innovation as well, so what solutions it can, it can bring for the people living in the north. Um, but when I was listening to Evan, before I give the floor to our, um, to Larsha, to our last, but definitely not, least, uh, not less person here speaking, it was a matter of sometimes, um, well, misconceptions that we held about interlinkages uh, between the Arctic, and I think this was something that you Lars Otto mentioned yesterday, um, how things actually started. Well, we were actually having many misconceptions of how Arctic, and especially via pollution, uh, is interconnected. So, with this, the floor is yours. Yes, and that is why science is so important to try to bring up uh, what's going on here, what's the processes, what's the sources, and where on earth is the solution. And as I illustrated uh, yesterday, the, the, the thinking about all the pollution that we saw, indication of back in some 25 years ago, everyone pointed on Soviet Union. And we had a big time, or a tough time, from AMAP when we presented the first report and said that the cesium we see in the Sea of Kara Sea and Barents Sea is not coming from Russia, it's coming from Sellafield in England. The reprocessing plant and the iodine came from France, from Cap La Hague. And this is so important as an illustration that you know what is the source here, what is the transport mechanism. So when you put in actions to improve it, you go on the right thing. You just don't stop, start, jump on, on a solution you think is the right solution. And I'm very pleased about this new science agreement because that is one of my babies from AMAP. Because if AMAP should be able to do its work, we need access to information, to access to geographical area, to get the data. So we have proper data to do the analysis. So for every ministerial meeting from the first one in Nuuk, back in 1993, we were calling for better access to data, to information about what's behind here. And that's so, this decision to start this process here started actually in 1990, well, at this ministerial meeting in Salicard to create a sustained Arctic Observatory Network. And that has been a big, long process that had not the easiest start of life, but then we get this agreement in place. And I'm really looking forward to that help. The agenda 2030, you ask what that has meant. Well, we started 25 years before and that came on the table. But the topics were on the table. The um, food security for the people in the north. Why was the food more contaminated than the food further south? To give that explanation. The health for the people. The, uh, the ocean has been a key part as the important for the food to the people. And of course, biodiversity. The linkages on the migration of birds and mammals. There are huge reductions here. Not because of what's going on in the Arctic, but on the way to the south. The resting place, the feeding places and that people are taking the grounds for the, for the birds so they don't have that places when they're migrating north-south. So there are a lot of information in the Arctic linked to what's further south. And again, the ocean here is a key player on transport of the heat to the north. That's natural growing up in Tromsø. We couldn't live in Tromsø. We would have the same climate as you have in Baffin Bay if we didn't have the Gulf Current coming up here. So to understand these processes and to understand what's going on with the climate change, how may that affect the changes here? So science, to jump back again, that has been a key peacemaking process. We were at the brink of a cold, we were in the Cold War and there were lots of nuclear weapons in the Arctic when we started the process. And science and environmental cooperation was a fantastic way to take down the tension. I remember the meeting in Oslo back in 92 when Vitaly Kimstash came with a white book from Jablako and said, confess, yes, we have dumped the nuclear waste in the sea. We have dumped the nuclear submarines. People were shocked. Such an openness about information from the military sides in Russia. And that was a fantastic step to start working on, on to, to work further on this. So that is key. The peacemaking part of science is important. And we can take that 
history to other parts. And we have already started a communication with Himalaya. And they are looking to the Arctic. Can we learn from the Arctic process in Himalaya between countries that are on the brink of war? And that's a fascinating situation. And again, use the environment, use the science to reduce the tension. You have some several questions here. It's, uh, maybe you come back to them later. So I, I stop here. It's, uh, yeah. All right. Yes, it's true. I challenged the panelists a little before with, with some questions. Um, but I think before I open the floor um, to the audience, one question that I have, of course, one aspect are interlinkages. And this we hear a lot. Lars Otto, you just mentioned ocean, for example, playing such a crucial role connecting Arctic with the, uh, with the rest of the world. But um, today also we heard in the first panel, and it was chair of senior Arctic officials, Alexei Harkonnen, who mentioned, well, we also need to know more Arctic specific features to inform global processes. And I think when we look at the goals, of course, they apply to the global, to the entire globe universally. But when, it, when we go down, when we start looking at indicators, um, I think oftentimes we may be missing those that are specific, that really capture the essence of what we should be looking in the Arctic. When we speak, speak about monitoring, of course, it is essential to so many efforts, but what to look at Really, how, how do you see what is missing in, in this? Where, where should we direct our research now? I guess I would, I would have this question to you maybe. We start with so, so if we start with interlinkages and, uh, and the question. Um, it, we have managed to do a fantastic job uh, on, on the goals about environment, uh, basically the sea and the land, as well as climate. Thanks to Lars Otto and his people and the Arctic Council and many good researchers in, in my institutions and elsewhere. Uh, where we haven't been so good uh, is the interlinkage between people's daily life and the globals when it comes to the economics, social, culture. Uh, we have a lot of research on the problem maybe of uh, colonization, but we don't talk about the future, the reality today and what possible paths we have in, in that world. So I think uh, a big gap is to w think about questions like why do the Arctic have a higher GDP per capita than any other possible part of the world? Still we have more like poverty problems in the Arctic than we have the rest of the Arctic countries. Uh, how is that possible? How can we even sit here and talk about lack of resources for education in native languages in the Arctic when that region is so rich? There is a fundamental gap in, in uh, maybe not knowledge, but it can be at least looking for solutions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, first of all, I, I like when you really showed that actually we, we tend to say that we don't need any more science. But then there are these misconceptions and, and things that are easy. We think that, oh, we can find some solutions, that this is how it is. But uh, there is a saying that what looks, uh, well, how things look like, they usually are not like that, but there is something else. And that's why science is so important. But to your question, I would say that um, if we want to be part of the kind of global community and um, somehow take the big picture uh, or be part of the big uh, process, I would say that uh, one is that what can we learn from the Arctic? And I think this came from the previous panels very much that Arctic could be a laboratory and actually is. And many things are tested here and showed here and that, uh, that could also come from the science. And then the other thing is these flows that how Arctic affects other parts and vice versa. I think those are really crucial issues to be able to, to do research on and also to show. So it's also the communicating and uh, doing things together. There are some critical connections between the world as such and the Arctic. And because of the tension we got some years ago, because of what happened down in Central Europe, you could see that affecting the Arctic immediately. We have a big research program underway in, in Russia that should be funded by the World Bank. But because of what happened, that project, a huge project to understand better the water management of the big rivers, is it something the Arctic has more than enough of? That's fresh water. And because of the climate change, there will be more fresh water in the Arctic. So how on earth use that resource? 
How can that be used? And we had a big project agreed between US, Canada, Norway, and Russia, funding from GEF World Bank, but we hadn't got a penny transferred before what happened in Ukraine. So the whole thing has been stopped. So what's happening further south is affecting work in the Arctic, science in the Arctic. And we have another way that is interesting in, the, in, in what's going on on, on, the, on the world, that is the migration to the north because of climate change. We see animals coming north, we see on the health part, we see new diseases, we see new bugs, and soon we will see more people coming north. And this is linked to the climate change and the access to resources, and you have open spaces in the north. So that's another area where science really need to look into this north-south connection here in the... And then, of course, coming back to the ocean, that's really important to understand what's going on here and what will happen in the future with the heat transfer and how that might affect the ecosystems in the north. Mm -hmm. Ivan, if I may, I will a little bit change this question uh, for you. Okay. And it, yeah, in a sense that, well, since you're in... In a way, you, you represent decision-making or policy-making side, more diplomatic efforts. So the question to you is how actually we can do better as scientific community in general to bring information, to inform decision-making processes. How, how, could we, how could we do better on that, if, if we can do better at all? Well, uh, part of that has to do with the energy and resources that are going on within individual countries. So scientists need uh, money, uh, they need access, which is a bit of what the, um, the, the agreement that uh, I was talking about before um, is all about. Um, and I guess you also have to have a receptivity within governments. Uh, to listen uh, to the scientists and to have processes that have that flow uh, available. Um, and also, I think, a uh, willingness to listen not just to one's own national scientists and one's government scientists, but uh, wherever the best available information in, scientists, in science is coming from, all of that has to flow to decision makers. All right. Thank you. And we return to original question. For you. <laughs> well, I, again, I'll go back to the uh, sort of bottom-up approach that, uh, you know, when I, I'm listening to, to questions that Northerners have, they're not normally structured along the 17 uh, specific defined sustainable development goals. They, they cross-cut. Uh, you know, how can I take more control of where, where my community is going? How can I uh, be more assured that uh, I'll be able to continue to source food from the land and the sea. Um, as, as the Arctic changes, uh, the traditional knowledge that exists, it's dynamic and it's always been dynamic and it continues to evolve because nature throws new questions at the people who exist in that nature. Uh, and sometimes the questions are difficult to solve uh, and generally a, a more integrated approach bringing together different ways of knowing uh, can perhaps more efficiently come up with answers uh, to the questions that, that northern citizens are, um, are asking. As, an, as a, a science knowledge agency uh, that's between those questions and the answers, we have the opportunity to then monitor the progress that's made through the development of that new knowledge and its application and turn that into reporting that does align with the 17 different categories uh, of sustainable uh, development goals and of course the details within each. Uh, the Government of Canada is uh, firmly convinced that the work that government agencies such as ourselves undertake has to have tangible demonstrable impact. It's not just how many of the things we do, it's what is the effect of the things that you do. Can you demonstrate that energy security is uh, advancing in the North because of the research that's, that's going on? Can you demonstrate that uh, the Northerners who are asking questions about uh, the safety of travel on sea ice at certain times of the year so that they can continue to hunt safely, can we demonstrate how we have improved that situation? And that gets back to you know, establishing uh, progress towards these goals. So there's, there's a need for an interface there between 
producers and consumers of knowledge in the north uh, who may or may not be uh, interested in tracking progress on a, on a scorecard. Uh, that's where government agencies are often the interface between the progress that's made and demonstrating to our taxpayers that we've done something useful with their money. So there's, a, there's an interface there that can be sometimes played by those knowledge agencies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to comment a little bit on that. Maybe not directly, but it's, it, it's, it relates to that. We have talked a lot about indigenous knowledge and modern knowledge and how that knowledge then is used by the policymakers. I see that we should move much further from that. It's not so much about having knowledge and when you have knowledge then you do better decisions. It's about doing things really in practice and that's the whole thing also in the sustainable development goals, how you can implement them. So I would claim that it is it would be more important to do experimentations and then also change our uh, way of doing practices is actually to use the knowledge that indigenous knowledge, other traditional knowledge, modern knowledge at the same time and think what we could do with that and how we can change the way that we are doing things and not so much what we know because it's not enough of knowing, it's, it's much more about changing the way we do things. How we do our everyday life, should I drink in the morning a orange juice or should I drink some local juice? I mean, really simple things. And uh, so we have, for example, been experimenting uh, how you can change school children's um, diets at school. So we do the recipes together with the school children. And what's the role of science is, that is actually to analyze how these experimentations work because once you get that kind of information then you can take it to other areas as well. The same way as we learned how it was a peace process, we can use that somewhere else in the world. So also here about make mainstreaming it. Mm -hmm. I think we have two more comments, but then we would open the floor to questions, which I'm sure we'll be getting. So, Lars? Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, we know uh, that science is essential to make wise and not stupid decisions. And all types of knowledge are important. Lars Schott has demonstrated that extremely clearly. And, and we cannot stop doing aggregate knowledge. Our problem is that we may be aggregate, not enough, but quite well in some areas, and we are not very good at aggregating knowledge, and particularly put it into application in other areas. So what was discussed in the previous panel about innovation, if you want to sustainable north, you need people who create jobs to make a future for themselves uh, through new means. And of course, to do that well, you need knowledge, you need capital, you need uh, some wisdom, and you need access to somebody to buy the, the services or products, whatever you're delivering. And the whole structure on that, we are not particularly good at because we perceive the North as, in a way, so few people that we can just subsidize them to sit there uh, and not be part of the society. And that need to change. Yeah. Language is a problem. The scientific language is un ununderstandable by normal people. So that's been a huge challenge, how to convey the unreadable scientific language you have in the scientific articles to a readable, understandable for normal people and policy makers. That's, that's a challenge today. And another challenge we have is that the natural science don't communicate with the social science and with the ecosystem science. We made in AMAP a report here adaptation actions for a changing Arctic. And that was a really big problem to get the different science groups to talk together and to trust and understand the methodology, the quality assurance. We have a long way to go there. We, I've been asked to do more integrated assessments and that's important, but we have to find a way how we communicate. How do we do science at the same time at different levels, but we can use it and come up with some readable, understandable messages to people living in the north, to decision makers, wherever they might be. All right. But I would like to open the floor to, to questions. Uh, so the only thing I would uh, ask you uh, just to wait for the microphone. So um, here in the first row we'll have, if you could shortly introduce yourself in the question. So if I may ask the microphone.
Harri Mäkinen, I'm ambassador for Northern Policies at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Finland. Thank you for this very interesting panel and discussions. I really appreciate also this that you raised the global dimension. I'm a big fan of science diplomacy and especially in the Arctic Council. I, I really think that it is a laboratory of science diplomacy and it can be, be a model for many other organizations. But at the same time, I'm very worried about certain things. Communication. It was raised the language issue, but also what kind of picture we give to the whole world, world about Arctic. If we see your uh, pictures, so you give pictures to us about snow and ice, and still we have in the Arctic from 200 to 100 days, which are not like winter days. So uh, communication is very important, and we have still in most of the Arctic areas four seasons. And that means that it's not about ice and so on. And then uh, Science, scientific work demands a lot of time. It's very slow, but policy decision makers, political decision makers, they really need, especially now when we, the climate, everything, climate change is faster than what expe expected, everything is moving faster. Policy makers are really needing more policy kind of solutions. And a reason because science is low and policy and even business solutions or business makers, uh, they need business solutions faster. So that's why we have seen a lot of think tanks which are not always so scientific. And even governments are using all kinds of think tanks to get proposals what they need. So there is a big challenge and I'm worried about this because sooner or later we start speaking about ineffective multilateral, multilateralism also in the context of the Arctic cooperation. So something should be considered in this context also that can we be more effective concerning this scientific diplomacy and, and what should be done. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, your question implicit carried a, a critics to my members, so and I actually happy on their behalf receive that critics. I think it's a fundamental problem in academia that we tend to be very good at describing a problem and analyzing it, but when you come to go to the action that follows, that is not rewarded in the academic system. Therefore, that is not necessarily what drives the scientists. And that's a big problem. And then you get the space where the think tanks or other organizations have a room. Maybe that's okay for society, but it's a bit stupid that you don't use the wisdom, knowledge of people, so the North, the Indus peoples, together with the science community, that we don't bring it closer towards the decision. And, uh, and I see some examples around in the Arctic where somebody are really good at it, so we should be happy for that. But we see also very often that they're not. And a fundamental thing that decision makers can do to change this is the way you reward knowledge. Because today, if I publish in Science and Nature, I get stars in a book and more money. If I speak with you about solutions, I don't get more money or uh, resources to my university. And that is a fundamental problem in the way you reward academia as governments. Mm. Next one. Yeah, I, I've been talking to in, in summer schools to students very much about this issue that should you really run only behind where you get some credits or not. I think the situation is not so black and white mm -hmm. and you can also go from what you think in the future is needed and, and so I encourage if there are any students to really see what, what you find interesting and go for the solution based research, go for the interdisciplinary research and train for that. But directly to your your question, I would say that there are methods in different parts of the world that could also be tested here. I think in the Arctic there has been a lot of this collaboration. Uh, they are really fantastic, but uh, there are also other things to try. I mentioned these meta-analyses. They are very important because there's lots of research about things. You don't always need new ones. You can do a really solid meta-analysis on scientific basis. The other thing is that you can develop synthesis by bringing together certain scientists 
to, uh, to this, uh, write a synthesis on a certain theme that is needed. And then the third one that is a little bit related to that is actually to organize thematic seminars where you bring in uh, researchers and, and decision makers, indigenous peoples, together to tackle a certain question and, and analyze that. And when we are talking about like circumpolar area, you can also do that on a web-based, uh, web-based and combined web-based and physical meetings. There's a lot of, of possibilities of, of that kind. There is, for example, a project called Eclipse that is developing for the Commission a mechanism for this science policy society where you can really systematically go through and, and write this uh, synthesis. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I see a question, but before I go there, um, I was thinking when we were actually, well, um, challenged the, the matter of how you reward uh, in academia and how you reward knowledge, I was thinking, well, University of the Arctic perhaps could have a say on this in a sense, well, Arctic has been setting example in so many areas and also University of the Arctic, which is absolutely amazing cooperative network. So perhaps you could actually consider, well, Raising the bar, setting the new standard, maybe in the Arctic, maybe in the Arctic universities, we should start really rewarding those, giving awards, really promoting this to start changing the system. Sorry. Quick to answer. First of all, yes, we do actually on education. There is a UArctic label you can get for innovative new joint across border education programs, and there mm -hmm. are such programs out there. And you can find 900 study programs in UArctic catalog. So there's not lack of education opportunities. Every week there are seminars between science and its peoples about something in the Arctic. And organizations like EMAP have done fantastic synthesis reports about many science areas and others in other fields fields are doing that all the time. So it is a lot of the good things happening in the Arctic. That is not our biggest problem, but we need in maybe even more. And push it maybe and, uh, also in, to the in south. One of the challenges for us is to find a way, uh, and we really need the research funders with us on the finding a way to reward the Arctic relevant science. Maybe the industry people should sit at the table and decide what is science priorities, what is quality in a research proposal. And that kind of experiment hasn't been properly done. Norfolk has done uh, something like it, uh, but we need more of that. Uh, and that is where we have an opportunity to actually continue to experiment in the Arctic. And I would like to add the science agreement again, is a fantastic fundament for doing such innovative solutions for the Arctic. Um, I just want to add uh, briefly that I, I really like the premise of the question, which is the connection of the importance of science diplomacy to the Arctic Council. Because I don't think that um, that's uh, discussed uh, nearly enough, considering that the working groups of the Council are uh, doing terrific science, and somehow the Arctic Council doesn't uh, communicate that well enough. So it's not just about pictures of polar bears and sea ice and all that sort of stuff. It's the basic fact that science that is done in the Arctic and the poles is vital to the entire planet and getting that information across was something we were you know, basically trying to do um, as an important theme within the US chairmanship for example it doesn't always work and there's lots of continue, continuing effort that needs to be done but um, it's a really important area Thank you. Do you want the Hello, Timo Kodera from the Arctic Center. Just thinking about the, so, so the sustainable development goals. So these are global, global goals. There are sub-goals, there are a huge number of sub-goals. There are also the high-level political forum has, has come up with a huge number of indicators. Very much nation-driven process. So if you look this from the viewpoint of the Arctic residents or Arctic communities, does it sound to you that this process is going to give us sustainable development? Or would you say, and this is, this is a challenge for you to think, would you say that we should kind of somehow translate this process to an Arctic language, to the language of, of those residents of the Arctic? 
and they would come up with, with kind of their own interpretation of what those indicators are to measure the, the, the kind of progress towards the, the sustainable development. Kind of one kind of concrete example is obviously traditional livelihoods and how big role they play in the Arctic and, and that is not taken into account really. So what type of research we need? I mean, this is, this is a fundamental question, I think. Well, if I, I start, so I, <clears throat> I think the Agenda 2030 really encourages all countries and all regions to develop their own, own ones and, and build from their own strengths and from their culture. So I think uh, the answer is really obvious that that should be carried out and uh, researchers can help, but it's a process for the whole society, not only for the researchers. Researchers can enable uh, with the, their uh, knowledge or with their analysis and bring alternative ways and say if these are chosen, then that might happen, but it's uh, for the whole society. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just having a look at the at the watch because it seems well. It's been time has been running so so fast. So I guess we'll be soon coming to to your last last remarks that I would ask you. And I have to say, well, I've been trying to well put some teams together that that were coming up, and there were there were so many of them that I was like all the time rewriting things and rewriting and add, and adding those. Um, but I think some some of the messages that we that we definitely heard today, and especially well, the, where the science can play a role. In the, in the art in, in realization of SDGs is one, of course, is a matter we need to better understand those interlinkages. And here, not only between the Arctic and the rest of the globe, but also, well, I love the picture what you show of Thai football, like how things are really tightly connected and so on, how we need to get better and under, at understanding those. So that's definitely one thing. But then, David, you mentioned, well, a matter of how we put things into effect, but then also how we monitor progress. The truth is that, well, we Without this information, we will not know how we are how we are doing uh, for for the next decade. How we are trying to reach those targets for for 2030. So that's that's obviously one thing. And then, Lars, mm, you mentioned well indicators, and I think it is it is, and this is great challenge, and it should be raised here once again that we are speaking about such rich countries, um, and yet oftentimes, well, we we deal with so much, we see so much poverty in the north, and then. I think it's, it's really also um, well challenge for for scientific community, but also in collaboration with uh, with communities, with decision makers, how to move beyond necessary beyond essentially economic indicators, because it seems that those are actually um, the main ones in the theater of decision making. So how can we really put other more relevant indicators for the Arctic to, to the center of the attention? I think this is this is definitely one one of the fields. And then, of course, well, it should it should be stressed, and we heard this a lot, and uh, about science diplomacy and about scientific cooperation agreement, because I think, and especially, um, it's also a matter not only how it works in the Arctic, but this example of um, Lachato you mentioned, the example that it also sets for other countries, and this is one of the goals: peace, um, how it can work, how through scientific collaboration we can strengthen we can strengthen those those ties. It didn't go unnoticed that we are still challenged that, as we've heard, well, some financial flows, despite the fact that we were able, that the Arctic Council has been doing such terrific job when it comes to um, maintaining collaboration, that there are some aspects that perhaps were interrupted by, by certain events. So ha there is obviously still field for, for work there. Um, and I guess, well, call, calls for engagement, calls for more engagement to all of us. But those were kind of um, some messages that I that I took. And I think, well, just to, just to close, I would ask you, well, your first, your advice, your message for us to take. What, what is the next step? What is the next thing to do so that we really change things coming ahead? And I started once again. Okay. okay. Uh, 2030 is not far away. We should invest in the Arctic Generation 2030. The young people today, which will be the leaders then, uh, or is the coming leaders at that time, education matters. That means we need to think about relevant education for the North, 
take care of their local languages and their cultures and tradition and bring the world in and maybe modernize rethink. It's actually not very expensive, it is possible, and there is the shame we don't do it. Uh, I think that is the most important thing, and a small tool, as I mentioned in the beginning, to make that happen is to establish a mobility program for the north, which we already have some of, but it's very easy to make it move, and it has a huge impact in the right way. Okay, so call to funders. When yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more. I also see that the young people are really, really important. Uh, something is, is mainstreaming is really important that it's, this is not an issue that's discussed only when there are specific sustainab sustainability sessions, but every, every meeting that there is, economic <coughs> meetings, the sustainability should be there. And then uh, finally I would maybe raise uh, again the issue when we are talking about science that it should be really important that uh, these kind of meeting points where you actually discuss these issues together with the scientists, with the practitioners and with policy makers and jointly think about how things can be done in practice and test them. Yeah. Science will be extremely important in the near future and also into the, the decades ahead. So I agree that you have to bring in the young ones and to bring them more active into what's coming up here. And we need to integrate more of the industry into what we're doing here, because the industry wants to go north to harvest. They want to harvest all the resources, biological and non-biological, as fast as possible. And you can't do that before you understand what the ecosystem can stand. And also the conflict you're coming into to the people living there already. So see that this is a real challenge to get the science to move so fast, so you can cope with what's coming here, because it will come. It's just a questionable time before the move to the north, both from here and there and everywhere. That's where you have the space, that's where you have a lot of new resources. So two very quick thoughts. One is the science agreement that we've been discussing here is not a sustainable de development agreement per se, but I think that any of the number of comments that we've heard here indicates why it is something that can help uh, bring sustainable development, so I think that's a that's a really good thing. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention is, uh, and I appreciate Lars Otto uh, focusing in on this in particular, is the importance of science and uh, science cooperation in promoting international peace and stability. Um, it, it really is something that we've seen uh, the tangible effects, and it's not just the eight Arctic states, it's a uh, wide panoply of states that are doing uh, polar science, um, and it's at the root of the International Geophysical Year, International Polar Years, those sort of things. Um, it's a really important topic. I'll uh, close by attempting to paraphrase my colleague Stephen Mooney from the Yukon, but I'll say it is in the Arctic, for the Arctic, by the Arctic. It really is that broad. Um, so that owner, local ownership uh, by local communities, local individuals who understand most what they see as the challenges in their life, how can we assist them in addressing those things. Uh, and uh, we'll just throw one impediment that is perhaps um, particularly relevant in, in Canada's Arctic, uh, the lack of uh, the broadband access that we enjoy in a place like this town uh, is a dream across much of northern Canada. It's The connectivity is by satellite, it's slow, it's expensive, it doesn't always work. Uh, so in order to share that knowledge and, and benefit and m multiply the, the positive effects when new knowledge solves a problem, uh, we also need to uh, improve our ability to communicate. Facebook works okay most of the time. You can send messages in the odd picture, but we really can't transmit large volumes. We can't do live distance education across Canada's north. We can't do telehealth properly. We can't have virtual consultations between people. We just don't have the bandwidth. So that's another big piece that we need to address in our country. Uh, and that reflects and it's part of the reconciliation effort. It, it, it shows where the power has to be and that's with the local people. And we have to stop driving these things from far away and let local people uh, take control and forge their own destiny and we can help with that, but it needs to be on their agenda. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it really excellently um, connects also with the, with the previous session that we had. Uh, but the point that you mentioned about youth, about young future leaders of the Arctic is actually also a per perfect introduction to the session that will be coming just now. So I would invite you to stay, to stay here because those will be exactly future young leaders of the Arctic discussing their, their views for the region. So with this, I would like to thank you very much and thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.